I'm Gavin Cleesby, the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you uh, to our program. Um, and I'm also happy to welcome all the people who are joining us online. Um, the Massachusetts Historical Society is an independent nonprofit organization. Uh, we maintain a significant research library uh, that has close to 14 million manuscript pages. We make all of our collection available to the public for free uh, and have been doing so for the past 230 years. Uh, we also host a wide variety of programs. Uh, we're only able to host programs like these thanks to the support of our members and donors. Uh, we hope that you'll return for some of these great events. Uh, we also hope people will become a member of uh, MHS or make a donation to support our work. Uh, this evening, we will hear from Scott Bain. Uh, Mr. Bain graduated from the uh, Cooney School of Law and has worked primarily with philanth philanthropic uh, institutions. He is a program officer at the John A. Hartford Foundation, which invests in aging experts and practice innovations that transform how uh, the care of older adults is delivered. The Hartford Foundation uh, has awarded more than uh, 625 million in grants to enhance the health and well-being of older people. Uh, he will discuss his new book, A Union Like Ours, uh, which explores the lives and relationship of Harvard University scholar and activist F.O. Uh, Matheson uh, and artist Russell Cheney. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our author. Thank you so much. My thesis is fairly straightforward, that F.O. Matheson and Russell Cheney were in essence married in everything but name and legal rights. I've been working on this project in one form or another since reading a book review of The Crimson Letter about gay men at Harvard. The book review appeared in the New York Times in 2003, so I've been at work on this project for a while. The review referenced Matheson and Cheney as well as Matheson's most influential book, American Renaissance, uh, Art and Expression in the Age of Emerson and Whitman. I went and checked out Matheson's book, First Chance I Got, and at the very beginning, it's place stamped Kittery, Maine. I'd grown up in the area, so that detail immediately hooked me. I started to read everything about Matheson, Cheney, and their lives together that I could. And I started to see their story of their shared lives together as a love story. The book has a brief autobiographical frame around it, not standard for biographies. But it, and it did not start out that way. It started out as a straightforward double biography about Matheson and Cheney. But at one point, I had the great good fortune of working with the wonderful writing teacher, Bill Zinser. And Bill said to me, why have you written this book? You're not an art historian or a literary scholar. What is it about this story that has captured your imagination? Um, and I, of course, I resisted this because it's not the way I saw my project, but I relented to the point that I was willing to give it a try. And it did solve one very important problem of not wanting to end the book on Matheson's suicide. Because uh, strange as it may sound, as heartbreaking as Matheson's death by suicide on April 1st, 1950 was, I don't read his and Cheney's story as a complete downer. <laughs> I, I really don't. There are sad parts of the story to be sure, but watching and listening to these two men figure out their relationship in which they had no living role models whatsoever is profoundly moving and fascinating to me. Matheson, probably as many of you know, was one of the preeminent literary scholars of the first half of the 20th century. Again, he wrote the book American, um, 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 American Renaissance, and he also helped found the field of American studies. Cheney was a moderately successful painter. Uh, during the, he was quite popular during the 1920s. He was the hot, not quite so young thing in the art world. Um, and in my mind, Cheney's best paintings uh, 
are his landscapes, still lives, interiors, and portraits of friends and neighbors of Maine and New Hampshire, where he and Matheson made their home. So Matheson's family background. Matheson was born in 19, 1902 in Pasadena, California. He was 20 years Cheney's junior. He grew up in LaSalle, Illinois, with his mother and paternal grandparents. He was very close to his mother, Lucy Orne Pratt, who had grown up in Springfield, Massachusetts, and was a distant relative, quite distant, of the, the main writer, Sarah Orne Jewett. She, Lucy Orne Pratt met uh, Frederick William Matheson Jr. at a resort in California. And F.W. Matheson Jr. was a playboy. And Matheson had a, a rather contentious relationship with him, although they were reconciled later in life. In one of the early letters from, about, uh, from Matheson to Cheney, he wrote that there was an empty space where my father should have been. Matheson was much closer to his paternal grandfather, who was the founder of the Western Clocks Clock Company, later known as West Clocks, and maker of Big Ben alarm clocks. Lucy Orne Pratt and F.W. Matheson Jr. were married at the Church of the Unity, a Unitarian congregation, as the name implies, in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1893. Indicative of the industrial era wealth of the Matheson family, F.W. Matheson Sr. gave the newlyweds a check for $5,000, the equivalent of $146,000 in 2021 dollars. But Matheson did not have a happy home life. His parents separated in 1908 and divorced in 1916. Matheson and his older sister lived with their mother in Terrytown, New York, about 40 minutes north of New York City. He was christened at Christ Church in Terrytown, which one of the wonderful little details I discovered was the congregation that Washington Irving worshiped at. Um, he attended boarding school at the Hackley School, and it was during his time at Hackley that he began to understand his attraction to other men. Math uh, Hackley led to Yale, from which Matheson graduated in 1923. And Matheson really came to life intellectually at Yale, as one would hope. Certainly his interest in literature, but also his interest in progressive politics, often in connection with organized labor. He won a Rhodes Scholarship and spent two years at New College, Oxford. Russell Cheney typified everything that Matheson valued. He was a darkly handsome gay man. He was stereotypical Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite, but in some ways, most importantly, he was a working artist. And it's been much more difficult to write about Cheney than it has Matheson. Matheson helped create a new field. He was famous during his lifetime. There have been many books and articles about Matheson um, and, and his legacy, whereas Cheney, as I said early on, was well known during the 1920s, but his painting has not had the influence that Matheson's scholarship has had. Cheney really came into focus when I started to put him in the context of his family. Born in 1881 in South Manchester, Connecticut, he was the youngest of 11 children of a very large extended family of silk manufacturers. <coughs> Cheney Brothers Silk Manufacturing uh, Company was a phenomenally successful business. Between the Civil War and World War II, they were one of the largest silk manufacturers in the United States. They introduced machine woven silk to the industry. And this slide here shows a rendering of the 36 acre campus in South Manchester, Connecticut. And the second slide 
shows a contemporary photo of the mills today. Another important piece of Matheson and Cheney's story, and again, the piece that really was my hook in, into them, is their connection to Maine. It's because of the Cheney family's connection to Maine that Matheson and Cheney ended up in the Pine Tree State to begin with. Cheney's mother, Edna Dow Smith, had been born in South Berwick, Maine, where Sarah Orne Jewett was from. Um, and several Cheney family members spent summers in York Harbor, Maine. I found the photo on the left um, at the Connecticut Historical Society indicating that it was the summer home of Knight Dexter Cheney, Russell Cheney's father. Then I found the photo on the right of the so-called Cook Cottage um, in a 1936 book entitled York Harbor, Maine. Cheney's father, for example, died while, while visiting York Harbor one summer in 1907. Cheney also graduated from Yale in, in 1904. Cheney was very popular at college, but also known for be being very quiet. He was elected into the prestigious senior society Skull and Bones, and it was there that he picked up the nickname Rat. <laughs> 20 years later, Matheson was also elected into Skull and Bones, where he picked up the nickname Devil. Um, and upon graduation, Cheney spoke publicly about wanting to be, he said, spoke publicly about wanting to become an architect, but his secret, his secret ambition at the time was to paint. Cheney studied at the New York Art Students League from 1904 to 1906. And it was an incredibly bold decision for him to follow his chosen professional path of painting and not go into this very successful family business. The desire to become a painter or an architect was not unheard of within the extended Cheney clan. Two of Cheney's great uncles, John Cheney and Seth Wells Cheney, had been painters and engravers. And Cheney's cousin, Charles Adams Platt, was a renowned residential and landscape architect. I, lo I love this photo. In South Manchester, Cheney created an artistic haven for himself when he converted a barn on the Cheney family compound into a painting studio. The main studio was the main room of the, of the studio was enormous. It was 40 feet long, uh, 20 feet wide with 15 foot ceilings and a large north facing window. The studio was lined with leather bound books, as you can see, oriental rugs and pieces of porcelain and china that Cheney had collected. And there were paintings everywhere on the walls, resting in racks, and resting in racks around the room. Matheson and Cheney met in 1924, 1924 aboard the ocean liner Paris. Matheson was bound for Oxford for the second year of his Rhodes Scholarship. He was 22 years old. Cheney was bound for Venice to paint. He was 42. And I'm going to read a short selection from the early chapter in the book entitled Falling in Love. On the fourth day of the voyage, Matheson decided to speak more candidly about sex. Presumably, he felt a spark of attraction to Cheney, and their shared skull and bone membership made it easier to reveal such confidences. Matheson brought up Havelock Ellis, whose writing on homosexuality he had read the previous spring, but then he backed away. Later, after an evening of stargazing on deck, Matheson, Matheson brought Cheney into his cabin to give him a good night snack of a pear. Then he summoned all his courage and jumped in. Quote, I know it won't make any difference to our friendship, but there's one thing I've got to tell you, he said by way of awkward preface. Referring to his days at the Hackley School, he's, 
uh, he declared, I was sexually inverted. Of course, I've controlled it since. Matheson described the miraculous moment that followed. The munching of the pear died away. There was perhaps half a minute of the most heavily freighted silence I've ever felt. Then, in a faraway voice I never heard came the answer. My God, feller, you've turned me upside down. I'm that way too. Matheson and Cheney sat for several minutes in stunned silence. They were no longer alone. Each man had found another, someone whom he viewed as an equal and a peer. Until then, both Matheson and Cheney had largely cordoned off their lives with friendships on one side and chance clandestine sexual encounters on the other side. But that night aboard the Paris in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, a different world in which love and sex could come together suddenly blossomed. This moment of emotional communion, however, did not lead to sex. Instead, Matheson and Cheney stayed up until four o'clock in the morning talking about their respective sexual histories and experiences as each man had done as part of his induction into Skull and Bones. When Cheney said goodnight before returning to his own cabin, he affectionately tousled Matheson's hair and thanked him for his courage in speaking so candidly. The remainder of the voyage passed quickly as Cheney and Matheson talked and talked. On the last night, they rested on the couch in Cheney's cabin with Cheney's head in Matheson's lap. Later, they changed positions with both men simply lying next to the, the other, fully dressed. Their shoulders and knees occasionally touched, words ebbed, as each man savored the presence of the other. And then Cheney turned and kissed Matheson squarely on the lips, and Matheson ran his fingers through Cheney's wondrously thick hair. In a more contemporary era, this might have been prelude to sex but not for Matheson and Cheney. As Matheson later wrote about the experience, that was all. The next morning we shook hands and I got off the boat at Plymouth. I knew I had a new, unbelievably rich friendship. He and Cheney made plans to meet in Italy over Matheson's Christmas holiday and pledged to write often. And right they did. Part of what makes Matheson and Cheney's story so appealing to write about is how incredibly well documented it is. During their lifetimes, they exchanged 3,100 letters with, with each other, which are held by the Bonnicky, Bonnicky Library. They, the letters are incredibly intimate and open. They told one another just about everything. Matheson and Cheney's relationship influenced Matheson's budding notions of literary scholarship, feelings, experiences, language, and literature all fused together as Matheson and Cheney fell in love. For example, Matheson was reading Walt Whitman's poetry in the early days of their relationship and wrote to Cheney that he was thrilled to discover that literature was not just about reading, it was about living. This is another the dining room on the Paris, and then this. And the relationship also influenced Cheney's painting. Prior to meeting Matheson, Cheney's paintings in Europe were of the well-known main stops on the tourist circuit, largely, but not exclusively, in Paris and Venice. But after Matheson and Cheney meet, Cheney moves in, a, in the direction of a, of a bolder, more stylized view of the world. He wrote to Matheson, quote, God feller, how I feel this last year, Cheney's writing in 1925, has enriched and deepened me. To have really felt Giotto and stood with you there before the windows of Chartres, to have at once reached the full expression of my physical life and to have seen the new vision of beauty, to know that to love and to create are the same. This painting of Matheson in Florence from 1926, Cheney did many paintings of Matheson over the years. This is one of my particular favorites. Um, Matheson's 24 years old here. I love his uh, young man ready to take on the world affect.
And Matheson's, oops, a few years later, Matheson's first book was published, uh, the first biography of Sarah Orne Jewett. Later, Jewett biographers have claimed that Matheson and Willa Cather helped resuscitate interest in Jewett's work. Matheson published the book in 1929 when he was 27 years old. Um, there were personal associations, he had many personal associations with the book, certainly his connection through his mother. Um, and Sarah Orne Jewett represents Matheson Cheney's only official public collaboration. Cheney contributed images of three paintings to the book, Miss Jewett's Staircase, 1927, Jewett House, likely 1927, and also Jewett Doorway, also likely to, was done in 1927. Matheson, as an adult, he was short. He was about five foot six inches tall. He favored rimless glasses. He was ambitious, driven, competitive. With friends, he could be warm and supportive, but he could also be sharp and explosive. And his speech was marked by pauses, as frequently when lecturing, as he carefully considered his words. Kittery, Maine. As I suggested at the beginning, the importance of Kittery cannot be overstated. And this is a photo of the house they shared in Kittery. Matheson and Cheney were very happy together in Kittery. Um, again, as I've suggested, they ended up there largely because of the Cheney's family connection to that part of Maine. But I would go so far as to say that as a couple, Kittery, Maine was their one true home in the world. And part of what fascinates me about Matheson and Cheney's story is that they were accorded a fairly high degree of privacy at Kittery. To live together as a same-sex couple from 1930 to 1945. Matheson's graduate students would join them for Thanksgiving dinners and on visits during the summer. Matheson had also gotten to know the uh, gotten to know T.S. Eliot when Eliot began as the Charles Eliot Norton Professor of Poetry at Harvard in the fall of 1932, and then over the summer of 1933, Eliot was a, a house guest of Matheson and Cheney's in Kittery. In interviewing Matheson and Cheney's students who were still alive when I began this project in the early aughts. Several of them said, you've got to understand it was a different world. We all knew he was gay, but we did not talk about it. Another photo of the house in Kittery. Another reason that Kittery was so important to Matheson was that he could relax there. He could get away from the stress at Harvard. He was working to help create the history and literature program. And while he enjoyed his students and uh, enjoyed the tutorial system at, that, that Harvard was using at the time, he also found it difficult being gay. One, a couple letters I'm going to read from briefly from January of 1930. Matheson writes to Cheney, another session with the professor of public speaking. He made some useful suggestions. He also told me my way of speaking tends to be blurred and soft. Does it? Am I just like any fairy? And then about a week later, Matheson writes, my sex bothers me, feller. Sometimes when it makes me aware of the falseness of my position in the world and consciousness of that falseness seems to sap my confidence of power. Have I any right in a community that would so utterly disapprove of me if it knew the facts? I ask myself that and then I laugh, for I know that I would never ask it at all if isolation from you didn't make me search into myself. I need you, feller, for together we can confront whatever there is. Cheney did many paintings of the house in Kittery over the years, including this one, entitled, not, not the most original title, uh, Face, Facing East, Kittery, Maine, 1944. 
Chini very much became a working artist, deeply connected and reflective of the community in Maine and New Hampshire, which he and Matheson were a part. And this becomes a very important idea in Matheson's work. The idea of an artist being connected and reflective of the society in which he or she is a part. It's a theme that is sounded in Matheson's book, Translation and Elizabethan Art. He also goes into it in American Renaissance. And one of the themes that I explore in the book is that Chini puts into practice ideas that Matheson considered in a more scholarly and analytical way. Cheney described how he sat near the ocean one night at Kittery, quote, sat there a long while with the tide swishing and swirling and gurgling, and the moon so bright and light on the house in pear blossoms, a wonderfully rich, poignant moment somehow, the sense of really belonging, of being fused with the surroundings, and part of it, a sort of wide open peace. Cheney captured the physical beauty of coastal Maine and New Hampshire. He was an en plein air painter and a frequent sight on the streets of Kittery and nearby Portsmouth with his easel. As I said, Cheney, Cheney really put down roots in Kittery and Portsmouth. He got to know many local people and many of them appeared in his paintings. One such painting is this one of Howard Lathrop in 1937. Lathrop was a local Portsmouth, New Hampshire fisherman and also friend of Matheson and Cheney's. This is one of uh, a strong portrait of Cheney's from the late 1930s. And I particularly like Lathrop's rather sensitive eyes. They're quite piercing. This particular portrait is one of the most reproduced images in all of Cheney's oeuvre, and it is owned by the Portsmouth Public Library in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. In May 1941, Matheson's most enduring work, American Renaissance Art and Expression in the Age of Emerson and Whitman, was published. American Renaissance is not strictly literary criticism, which is one of its appeals. Uh, in, in the book, Matheson taps multiple disciplines, literature, history, painting, sculpture, and architecture. And the question at the center of the book is fairly straightforward. In the years 1850 to 1855, a number of classic texts by American authors were published, including The Scarlet Letter, 18, 1850, The House of Seven Gables, 1851, Moby Dick, 1851, Walden, 1854, and Leaves of Grass, Grass 1855. Matheson, in essence, asks why. What did this moment of cultural expression represent? How did it come about? And why did it happen when it did? In subsequent decades, the book has been criticized as being too, as being too narrowly conceived, but the book did help establish the field of American studies. And that in turn helped establish Matheson as one of the preeminent scholars of his generation and published the public, uh, paved the way, rather, to his appointment as a full professor at Harvard in 1942. On the surface, Matheson and she would in many ways seem to live a charmed life. A beautiful house in Maine, Cheney's paintings, Matheson's books and writing, but both men had more than their fair share of health problems. For Cheney, it started in 1916 to 1918 when he was treated for tuberculosis at Cragmore Sanatorium in Colorado Springs. Cheney lost three of his 11 siblings to tuberculosis, one sister and two brothers. He was plagued by breathing problems throughout his life. But beginning in the late 1930s, Cheney was again in and out of sanatoriums for breathing difficulties and increased problems with drinking. 
Lewis Hyde, who edited the collection of letters Rat and the De Devil, you recognized those nicknames, uh, published in 1978, speculates in his notes to the book that in the last years of Cheney's life, he had crossed the line into alcoholism. The Hartford Retreat was founded in 1822 by Dr. Eli Todd, who created Moral Treatment, which maintained that mental illnesses are, were curable diseases rather than moral failings. Cheney was treated at the retreat in 1938, and treatment at the time considered, uh, consisted largely of rest, occupational, physical, and talk therapies. It's not known exactly what Cheney was admitted to the retreat for, but judging from the correspondence between him and Matheson, it seems that Cheney and his doctors believed that his ongoing breathing difficulties scared him and or made him uneasy for obvious reasons and that he drank excessively to try and calm himself down. Many of the institutions in which both Matheson and Cheney found themselves catered to well-to-do men and women. Uh, these institutions tried to erase all traces of institutional life as, as much as possible and create a home-like atmosphere. During Cheney's time at the retreat, it boasted a barbershop for men, a dressmaker and beauty shop for women, a regular afternoon tea, a library, a smoking room, a gym, a pool, tennis courts, and a bowling alley. Matheson entered McLean Hospital the day after Christmas in 1938 nominally over the stress of completing American Renaissance. And it was at McLean that Matheson recorded his first suicidal in impulses. He wrote, I was hauled out of sleep by the fantasy that it would be better if I jumped out a window. And during the succeeding week in Kittery, I was recurrently filled with the desire to kill myself. Associated with Harvard Medical School, McLean has had many famous patients over the, over the years, including poets Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath, and Robert Lowell, as well as singer James Taylor. McLean was originally uh, situated on two, two, or 250 acres in Belmont, Massachusetts. It's still there, but much smaller, which is about a half an hour west of Boston. McLean had all the comforts of the Hartford Retreat and then some. Uh, beef and dairy farms, vegetable and flower gardens, apple and pear orchards, and even an apiary, all for occupational therapy par excellence. Matheson wrote several long diary entries that described his treatment at McLean. He underwent hydrotherapy, soaking in a tub to relax. He took a pottery class as a form of occupational therapy. He exercised and listened to music to relax him. And he participated in talk therapy. As usual, Matheson and Cheney were more intimate in their letters. Matheson wrote to Cheney, while well, from McLean, well, the letters warmed me right through, just like they used to do when I was at Oxford or you were in Santa Fe or whenever we were long apart. It is one of the real beauties that never once has the freshness of your life lost any of its magic for me. Every day is a new discovery of your wealth. Beginning in the fall of 1940, Cheney was in and out of Baldpate Hospital for roughly three years. Located in Georgetown, Massachusetts, about 40 minutes north of Boston, Vault paid open in 1939, led by Dr. Harry Solomon, who was an early proponent of halfway houses, which specialize in helping patients acclimate themselves to life in the community outside of institutional walls. Baldpate specializes in treat or specialized, excuse me, in treatment for drug and alcohol addictions personality disorders, neuroses, and psychoses. Cheney was probably admitted to Baldpate for his drinking. Doctors at Baldpate relied on, uh, relied on, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I skipped a note. Uh, 
relied on neurological means to cure mental illnesses, in addition to psychiatric treatments such as talk therapy and occupational therapy. As a consequence, doctors at Balpate relied on shock therapies, including insulin shock therapy, in which a coma is induced in a patient with large doses of insulin, and metrazole and electroshock therapies in which seizures are induced in patients. Doctors at Baldpate also performed lobotomies. I've uncovered circumstantial but fairly compelling evidence that in May of 1942, Chini underwent metrazole shock therapy to try and help him with his drinking problem. As Cheney wrote to Matheson on May 4th, 1942, I want to take the drastic step that he, Dr. Fleming, Cheney's doctor, suggests. I don't care how hard it is, I'm going to do it. A course of metrazole shock therapy consisted of approximately seven injections of the, of the drug over four weeks. Metrazole induced seizures in patients, the idea being somewhat akin to rebooting your computer. Doctors were trying to help patients reboot their nervous systems. Seizures typically started 15 seconds after an injection and lasted for up to a minute. Patients were bound and gagged during the procedure so as not to hurt themselves. Perhaps not surprisingly, metrazole shock therapy was not successful in helping Cheney with his drinking. But in 1943, he did hit on a method of better controlling his drinking, especially during the winter months. He went to live with his sister, Theodora, and her husband in Texas, where the climate did not aggravate his breathing problems, and he drank less to uh, to overcome his anxiety and stress of that. But he missed New England and missed life with Matheson, and he, had re and he returned in the early summer of 1945. Cheney died on July 12, 1945, of thrombosis, a blood clot in the circulatory system. Cheney's body was returned to South Manchester, and he was buried from the same house in which he had been born. After Cheney's death, Matheson worked diligently to secure the painter's legacy. Notably, in 1946, 1947, he published a monograph of Cheney's work entitled Russell Cheney, A Record of His Work, which remains the single most comprehensive volume devoted to Cheney's work until this day. In the days, weeks, and months, and years that followed Cheney's death, Matheson, as if seeking camaraderie in a different sphere, threw himself into political activism. Since his earliest days as a student at Yale, Matheson had been interested in political activism, often in association with organized labor. But after Cheney's death, his activism was nonstop. And following on this slide and the next one is a list of all the events and organizations with which Matheson was affiliated. And this was in addition to his teaching duties at Harvard, writing books on Henry James, the James family, and Russell Cheney, as well as editing collections of Henry James's stories and notebooks. Matheson's grief over Cheney's death presumably contributed greatly to his nonstop political activism. But there's a social aspect of grief here too, especially for same-sex couples of the era that can't be ignored. Matheson couldn't let on to the world how deeply he was grieving. To the world, he had simply lost his good friend and housemate. The, I maintain that this forced dissimulation over the depth of his grief, having to hide the depth of his grief on some level, must have played a part in his deepening depression in the years after Cheney's death. In this next, this next section I'm going to read is from one of the later chapters in the book entitled, Losing Touch, Life Without Cheney. 
But if happiness beckoned across the Atlantic, subterranean thoughts and emotions simultaneously compelled Matheson toward a darker course. Matheson had returned to Boston from Maine, and on Friday, March 31st, he left his Pinckney Street apartment and checked in at the Manger Hotel on Causeway Street adjacent to North, North Station. Matheson needed height for what he planned to do. He was shown to room 1219 facing southwest. Matheson had dinner plans at the home of Kenneth and Eleanor Murdoch back on Beacon Hill, so he did not settle in into his hotel room for the night. To Murdoch, Matheson seemed tired and depressed at dinner. Matheson presumably didn't say anything to his friends about having checked into the Manger Hotel earlier that day. On parting after dinner at about 30 minutes before midnight, Matheson told the Murdochs to remember that he loved them. It was a cloudy night, but comparatively mild for early spring with temperatures in the high 40s. On getting back to his hotel, Matheson continued to prepare his room. On the desk, he placed his skull and bone pin and a letter in which he asked that his friends Kenneth Murdoch, Helen Bain Knapp, and Ruth Putnam, as well as his sister, Lucy Newbrand, be not contacted, but not until morning. In the letter, Matheson also asked that they go to his apartment and see that several other letters on his desk were mailed. In one of those le letters, Matheson told Paul Sweezy that he feared there was, quote, nothing but desolate solitude ahead. He told Lewis Hyde, that he could no longer bear the loneliness with which I'm faced. To his friends generally, Matheson wrote, I am exhausted. I've been subject to so many severe depressions during the past few years, I can no longer believe that I can, can continue to be of use to my profession and my friends. I hope my friends will be able to believe that I still love them in spite of this desperate act. Perhaps another half an hour passed. Matheson took off his glasses. Perhaps time enough to think about the cottage in Kittery, the most beautiful house in America, or to recall the cats, Baby and Pretzel. Time enough to remember riding his bicycle through the English countryside during his Oxford days, shouting out with joy, rat, rat, my godfeller, how I love you or the day he stood on the beach in Maine, clad only in seaweed, arms outstretched toward the ocean and sky, or the incident of the pair, the night aboard the Paris after he and Cheney met. At about half past midnight outside the manger on Nashua Street, a taxi driver named Jesse Reeves was startled by a tremendous noise. A man had just fallen or jumped from a 12th story window. Matheson was still breathing when the ambulance crew arrived, but he died before they could reach City Hospital two and a half miles away. And he's buried in Springfield. As I said at the beginning, the book ends with a short autobiographical chapter about how my then partner, now husband, <laughs> David and I had an, our own journey through the land of illness with back-to-back -back cancer diagnoses and then getting deciding to get married about a year after marriage equality passed in New York State. We read one of Matheson Cheney's early letters at the ceremony as if bringing them into the wedding. And this is Matheson's letter. Marriage, what a strange word to be applied to two men. Can't you hear the hellhounds of society baying in full pursuit behind us? But that's just the point. We are beyond society. We've said, thank you very much, stepped outside and closed the door. And then this last short reading is how the book ends. There was only one thing about the wedding that David and I would have done differently. We did not take a post-wedding trip. Being 17 years into our relationship, I couldn't quite bring myself to use the word honeymoon. We got married on Saturday, and on Monday, both of us went back to our day-to-day -day lives. This was a mistake. 
Getting married was exhilarating. And in retrospect, it would have been nice to have had a little decompression time. But we didn't know that. We were figuring out things as we went along. Not helping matters, it poured down rain that Monday morning after the wedding, cascading streams of water, and I was beginning to come down with a head cold. I drifted into a maudlin state. That morning, David sent an old photograph of himself as a young man to a friend and copied me on the email. Many years ago, her husband had died prematurely of cancer. The dark, rainy Monday morning, not feeling well, seeing David as a young man and thoughts of early deaths from cancer all set me off. I started to cry. I'd been so exhilarated over the weekend, but I was suddenly conscious of life's fragility and its brevity. One of us will likely die first. And although my ill health could hold surprises, based on our ages, David is likely to go first. The warmth, companionship, intimacy, and love, such that I had never known in my adult life, will come to an end. Will I die? Will the end kill me? I stood in the bedroom crying. By this time, David had showered and dressed. He too stood in the bedroom, ready to go to work. He wasn't going to descend into this morass of unfounded fears and anxieties with me. He gave me a hug and a kiss and put both hands on my shoulders. Yes, it will end, he said, but we will have experienced something beautiful and timeless and the world will go on. He looked at me with his steady, calm blue eyes. David left the apartment crying. I waved from the window, so intensely aware of the impermanent and transitory nature of the moment. In their day, Matheson and Cheney kept love alive in the face of some daunting obstacles. And they in turn helped me to keep love alive. I suppose it is this cycle, this transfer of spirit and values that gives me any real sense of immortality as a palpable force in the world. Others will follow David and me, just as we followed Matheson and Cheney, and unions like ours will continue to be written. The end. <laughs> Hi there. So, uh, why uh, do you speculate they weren't buried together? I, I think of uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman in England who left very emphatic instructions that he wants to be buried with his companion. Why that never, did that occur to them? Was that a mystery or something? It, it did not occur to them. Cheney is, and I didn't say this on that slide, but he's been, as you might imagine, there is a fairly extensive Cheney family plot at the, in, a, in the South Manchester uh, um, cemetery. And so it was never a question. I mean, Matheson is buried near his mother. And there was, I think it was Wallace Stevens who said in a letter that that act was just intensely sad, that there was something about that act that suggested a man who was not broken by the world, but sort of not reconciled with it. We have some um, gratitude, a lot of gratitude for um, publishing this book and people saying that I really resonated with that. So, uh, question, you know, when you uh, describe uh, this in, in great detail, this uh, the pair incident, um, how do you know these details? I mean, uh, is this in their records? Are they recordings? The, um, uh, the letters. The letters are incredibly well detailed. And I mean, it implies, as someone recently said, they spent a lot of time apart. That's why they wrote so much. But it, it's a, it was a funny combination because they were apart, but not that far apart. That Cheney was largely based in Kittery and Matheson was at Cambridge during the week and he would go to Kittery on weekends. He was there every summer. 
Um, but the letters are incredibly well documented. I mean, that early, that early section I read from um, comes from their letters. Um, you know, now there are some things that it's my interpretation. I mean, the idea of, oh my God, this is, this is, this is a moment in which love and sex come together. That's me speaking. As, as the researcher and writer. Um, but their letters really form the basis of being able to piece together, as I, as I started with, that this is in essence a marriage and everything but name and legal rights. And, uh, not really connected, but how long did this project take you? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the day of the marriage. And it was, you know, overwhelming. Yeah, um, and I'll preface it by saying, I'm glad you're sitting down. Um, it took me about 18 years. So, I, and as, as our friends have joked, oh, the book is ready to go to college now. <laughs> uh, well, unless there's any other questions, thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful lecture.